Welcome back to the podcast and I have a real treat for you today. Hollywood is here and it's actress and singer Linda Pearl. You might know Linda from lots of different roles such as Happy Days, The Office, Matlock, Murder, She Wrote, so many different acting credits. There are films such as A Last Cry for Help and her beautiful singing voice. She quite often does cabaret and so many theatre productions. I'm fortunate to chat with Linda because of the current theatre production that she's in with her partner Patrick Duffy, who you might know as Bobby Ewing from Dallas. And it's touring the UK and I'm fortunate to be going to see it when it arrives in Glasgow. So in addition to that, I was able to catch up with Linda and find out before I go to see it what Catch Me If You Can is about, exactly what goes into touring, some little secrets about what's been happening on the current tour and a lot more chat too. So I'd like to thank Linda again for her time. I really did learn a lot and stick around at the end because I'll tell you exactly how you can follow Linda and what she's up to on social media. Oh, Linda, thanks so much for joining me. Thanks Thank for having you. me. And uh, you are you right in the middle of the Catch Me If You Can tour? We sure are. Hence the hat. I wear a wig in the place, so it's just, it, it's hat days because it's, it's wig nights. Um, yeah, where are we? We are in Eastbourne at the moment. We are on venue number 12. Last night we had, we did performance 96. So... This Saturday, we'll hit 100. And by the time we reach you in Glasgow, we will, I don't know how many more. I don't know. We, wow. We'll be 150 or something like that. But And yeah. do you, I always, because I do the makeup side, I love the behind the scenes. And I mm-hmm. think we get the energy from the actors. Mm. Do you, I hear a lot of people say that it is a bit different every night. So when you say 100 and I think, oh, 100, but is it always a little bit different? Absolutely. For, for many reasons. I mean, your own just energy is different. Uh, and the audience is different every night. I mean, and the, it's been interesting because with the 12 venues we've been, we've, we started in Windsor, which is near London. We were up in Belfast. We were over in Cardiff. We've been in Birmingham and areas around there. We're now down more towards the South where we'll linger for the next while. And so the, the, the cultural character of the audiences change regionally. And then of course, every night and also great swings between the matinee and the evenings. So with seven of us on stage and anywhere between 500 and a thousand in the audience, uh, it's, it's bound to change. And you've got Gray O'Brien, haven't you? And he is, I don't know if he's Glasgow, he's definitely Scottish, but um... He is Glasgow, and he's the only reason I can understand your accent now because we we <laughs> your beautiful accent. I I we laugh because sometimes Gray has an impeccable American accent and a very thick to my ear Glaswegian accent. So uh, there were many times we just said, "I don't know what you're talking about. Put on your American accent just for a moment," and then we. That is that is so true. That is so I'm true. determined to come out of this with a decent. Scottish accent it, it's hard for my ear to to grasp it but it, it's beautiful it's it's melodic I mean the the English language sounds much better in a Glaswegian accent than it does in a flat American accent oh, so but do you know we love an American accent when <laughs> I was at, when I was at school and I, I did drama but I am not good at it but we we did it at school and they actually told us all to stop acting in American accents because we would just switch on American and the teacher said you've got to stop and I think it's because everything that we watched and everything we loved was American sure you get acclimated to it sure Mm -hmm. well listen we're just grateful Patrick and I that we don't have to put on a British accent because that would be a disaster we just oh I I don't believe that but it's funny that you say about the the Glaswegian accent too um even today I I said oh I'm having a blether with Linda Pearl and then I thought oh blether that's probably a very Scottish thing to say I don't know if that's something that maybe Gray would have said having a chat having a blether (laughs) yeah yeah a chat certainly yeah Uh, okay one more one more term I've just learned well, there you go. See, it's always learning. Was it they say every day is a school day? 
That's right. So the play, Catch Me If You Can, I obviously, when I was booking it, I was straight in reading what it was all about. And it tells you very quickly, it is not anything to do with the film Leonardo DiCaprio, nothing to do with it. It actually, I, I deliberately not read too much because I want to see it and see it unravel. I don't want to give myself spoilers, but right. I know the basics. So would you mind sharing the basic synopsis sure. with us? Sure, it's an interesting piece. It's so much fun to do. And I, I think it's, it's fun for the audience to discover. Our experience when we first read the play was, well, first of all, it's a detective murder mystery comedy thriller. So it's a lot of things in one. It's very, very fast paced impeccably written. I just learned actually, let me get the information, that the granddaughter, I'm just gonna, yeah, Judith Gilbert, who is the, excuse me, the daughter of one of the playwrights, Willie Gilbert, is going to be coming to see the play in Glasgow. So I assume she lives ah. either in or near Glasgow. So yeah. that will be a, 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 real, a real treat. Um, yeah, it's uh, when we were first reading the play, we thought, oh, we've got this figured out. And then you turn the page and realize, no, you don't. Suffice to say that no one is who they seem to be when they first appear on stage. And there are unguessable twists and turns that, that happen right until the last minute of the play. So that's been, been fun. And, and now that, of course, we've been in it for a while, we can see how, how strongly written the play is because the clues are there right from the top so um you know an incredibly smart audience member might be able to figure it out but I doubt it oh and <laughs> it's funny you say that because when I watch things I tend to just let it unfold in front of me I mm -hmm. don't try to second guess mm -hmm. so I wonder when I'm watching it if I'll be noticing little things and picking up because normally I just let it you know sometimes you're watching a film with someone and they're doing a commentary and they're saying I bet they did this I bet that's that I tend to just let it unfold but do you think even those people that would normally say oh I bet this and I bet that do you think they will still be fooled no idea I, I oh yes I do oh, yeah. because that's been our experience so far yeah that, that has absolutely uh been the case so far so yeah I think, oh i cannot I think, wait i think we'll fool them again and i also thought it was really interesting that i saw i think it was an interview that you did and there was um was it when the set didn't quite make it in time and in today's world so many people just cancel things they're just very quick to cancel but you didn't cancel we didn't and part of that is now i think time and the time of theater rather live theater or performance in the time of covid and apparently climate change we were yes what you're referring to is it was storm franklin i think it was in january end of january top of february and we were slated to go for we had finished the night in windsor on saturday a huge storm blew through saturday night i mean trees were down everywhere sunday and it was, but there was a second, even a third wave of the storm yet to come. We were all slated to fly and on the Sunday to Belfast to open the Monday, the set was, was struck on Saturday night, put into the trucks, driven to the port uh, in order to catch the ferry to across the Irish Sea. And as we were taking off from Heathrow, we were getting texts from other cast members saying, oh, our flight's been canceled because we were all traveling differently. Right. It was just our fabulous dresser, Johnny, Patrick and myself who were on the flight. And, and we were joking. We thought, oh, won't this be silly? Well, if nobody else makes it, ha ha. Um, you know, I'll do some cartwheels. Patrick will read some poetry. And Johnny does a fabulous pink lollipop boy. And we thought, oh, yes, this will definitely be worth the price of admission. We'll do that instead. By the time we got our phones switched back on in Glasgow, our phones were blowing up with text messages. The set had not been able to leave, would not be able to leave. It was stuck in the mainland. And nobody else could get to Belfast. So by now it's pretty late at night and I do a concert. So I thought, well, I could do a concert. And we were talking with the producers who we love and they said, okay, what do you need? And I, my goddaughter lives in Belfast. So I reached out to her. I'm telling you this in the longest possible way. I love it. 
reached out to my goddaughter. I said, I need a jazz musician, a jazz pianist who can be a strong, a strong reader because he'd be sight reading the show the next night. She found a couple of people, but then our producer said, how about you and Patrick do Love Letters, which is a play, a two-hander written by A.R. Gurney. And it's a series of beautiful love letters written to a man and a woman over the course of their decades long friendship. And they sit there and read, read the letters. So it's, it's a beautiful play and one that we could do, but we couldn't, we didn't have the script. And obviously since nothing was flying or moving, there was no way to get the script except by email. The London office tried, it was still eight hours behind in Los Angeles, five to the East Coast. So I reached out to a bunch of half a dozen friends of mine who own theaters in LA say, do you have a PDF that you can email me of love letters? Cause they had the full day to try to find it. By the time we woke up Monday morning, there was an email in our inboxes. So we did that play that night. And the audience in as much as the box office could had contacted ticket holders for Monday night saying we're up against it. And if you want a refund or try to come later in the week and but people came and it was so much fun because here we were in this real life circumstance all together. So we did the play in the huge, beautiful Grand Opera House in Belfast with no set, just Patrick and me with our little books reading. And we did a talk back later that went on for about an hour. And I feel like we learned as much about them as perhaps they learned about us. I don't know. Oh, that's lovely. very sweet because I had said I I asked the audience who were there in the Q and A afterwards where we could get some Irish soda bread, and a couple of people said, "Oh, go to this place, that place." Like, okay. And on our last event, two days later, we did that for two nights because the set couldn't come for two days. Eventually, everybody else got in. The set was put up. We did we did the play for the rest of the week, and on our last night as we were leaving. At this stage door, there was an audience member. And he said, we were in the, I was in the audience when we did the Q and A, you asked for some Irish soda bread and here it is. And he brought a loaf of Irish soda. I mean, really, how sweet. Oh, that's lovely. So there are all these other sort of ancillary stories that got woven into the experience of doing it. Um, we have the best possible cast. Um, with this, I mean, Gray O'Brien is just you know gorgeous, gorgeous actor. Um, we have Ben Nealon and Paul Labors, and I mean, we're a very merry band, and it's going to be a sad day in Glasgow when we when we part company at the end of this run. Do you feel this one? Well, I've I've actually seen Love Letters before. It was um, Glynis, Barbara, and Michael Brandon, and I wonder because. You and Patrick are a couple, and they were a couple. Do you think that adds an extra level to it? Because we're watching it, and we're it's just a lovely play. Because, again, it's just like you say, it's just people reading letters. And mm-hmm. That must have been a really special extra moment that, even though they didn't see Catch Me If You Can, the people that saw it must have thought, this is a real treat. I hope so. I, I hope they did. It, it was for us to do. And uh, oh, that's lovely. Um, and see, um, because this is a sort of the, one of the first post COVID tours that you're doing, do you think there is that extra level of tightness? Without a doubt. Yeah. Without a doubt. It's so much, so much fun to be in part of this wave of all of us attempting to get back to some semblance of normalcy. And now, of course, there's the added unbelievable ongoing horror and tragedy of the Ukraine that we're all watching. And it's just, you know, where is normal? Where is, what do you, what do you hang on to that's, that's familiar and truth is i think this is where this is where you help us i think being able for we we don't know what to do and we can only support you know you can donate money you can Mm -hmm. again if you can take in refugees but people like yourselves are actually helping us keep our normality and do you know um you know i mean you're helping us see the the normality in days the things to look forward to keep us all calm Well, I hope so. I mean, that's certainly the function for us. We get to escape to this little bubble oasis of fun and laughter 
for two hours on a daily basis. So I feel selfishly, it's, you know, it's more of a treat for us really <laughs> than, than for the audience, but it's just, I mean, who can get their minds around what, what's going on and what's mm. to come? Oh, it's crazy. You know, with inflation and the prices of everything skyrocketing. It's we're, we're not living in easy times. And mm. uh, I just have to give a, a, a shout out to our, our producer, many, Bill Kenwright, um, a really extraordinary guy. He, um, I, I, I mean, I'm on, I'm under no illusion that that theater comes first in his heart, life, and and mind. It's Everton, all things first. Hence the blue lettering on our cap. So, but um, but we we saw him the other day, and and uh, well, as we tour, we see posters of lots of other shows two at the theaters, either they've come before us or they, they, they're they coming right after us. And a lot of these tours have disappeared because people are scared. They don't necessarily have the expendable income. If they do, they wanna hang on to it because they may need it when it gets cold again and totally understandable. But so, and, and with the cost of petrol, I mean, you know these shows are going hither and yon, up and down the and crosswise the all of England, and so those costs have now what quadrupled, something like that, oh. unexpectedly. I mean, who can plan for that physically? What production company can stomach that? Has the nerve to stomach that? Well, Bill Kenwright does, and I said, how is it possible that you're, you know, keeping us out on the road? And he said, well, he believes in the long term, and the long term. He feels that things will come right and that the theater will survive, that it's crucial for the theater to survive. And he said, unless he, and along with others, keep the circuit alive, th these theaters will, will die. You know, people will find better things or other things to do with their, with their time. The theaters won't be able to keep their, their staff. Um, you know, it will crumble. It's hard enough that people are just starting to come back after the pandemic. So he is a he is a true believer in wins or losses. He is all in. So I, you know, working for this man is a real life lesson. It's uh, I guess he's got grit and he's got the, he is the embodiment of the carry on spirit. Wow. So. And his name again, like yourself and Patrick and great, like the name carries weight. When we hear the name, mm -hmm. it's a fortunate position. I think you probably don't hear people say it that often but when we hear your names it's a no-brainer you you want to watch it you want to see it so we know it's going to be good I hope that's not too much pressure <laughs> well it's a lot of pressure and I thank you for saying so I if, if it's true I, I thank you very much and it's also that leads me on again to I saw on Instagram that you managed to do your singing show too how would you phrase that would you call it cabaret or is it yeah. no it's cabaret right uh-huh it is Cabaret. I, uh, yeah, I mean, normally I do a concert once a month or so. And of course, at the top of the pandemic, it was all off the table. Everything was canceled for two years, canceled. I did a couple of Zoom concerts, but it's not the same. Mm -hmm. So now being on the road for this six months, I really started to miss music. I mean, with an ache, I started to miss music. And Got very lucky, one of my most favorite pianists in the world, Billy Stritch, a fantastic jazz pianist who, I mean, he was music director for Liza for many years and also for Tony Bennett and a host of others. And anyway, Billy's become a long-term friend now out of New York and he happened to be in London during our one week off in this six month tour. So we called a club and they said, yes, we can squeeze you in this one night. So it, it all worked out and it was just, uh, it was it's like going to the chiropractor, <laughs> Just, you know, getting realigned on a, on a different level. Oh, and your voice is so beautiful. I'm oh, thank you. On YouTube, I love YouTube. The way that I describe it is it's like a television channel that you can watch any program you like at any time. And you yeah. can type in a name and see what comes up. And there's quite a lot of your singing that comes up, which, oh, you've mm. got a beautiful voice. Do you thank ever, you. that's the thing I think a lot of people say, uh, do you ever look to see if anyone's uploaded something that you might have forgotten or maybe it's came into your head and you think I wonder if I type this in if someone's actually 
taking a recording of that for me or is it something um sure sure i do i mean i'm i'm guilty of going to dr google for any number of things uh -huh. uh, you bet I think it is. It's so handy for me if I'm if I'm reminiscing about a program or even an ad and I'll say, I wonder if that's on YouTube. Nine mm -hmm. times out of 10, you go on and someone's uploaded it. So you get to see and you're sure. like, that's that's what I was talking about. That's the song. <laughs> and it's just sure. there. It's so handy. Mm -hmm. And I think that leads me on again. Um, I, the podcast has got a lot of sort of focus on some meant to be moments. And I think we were just saying there with the, the play, that seems as if it's got a lot of meant to be moments that actually led the play to be. And it's just all these situations that occur and you think that was clearly, that was meant to be, but even the horrible pandemic in a funny way that led to where you are now, it was obviously meant to be. It, it did. And I, early on, uh, I remember reading somewhere people were, we were all saying, well, we're all in this together. And, and we, we were, and we are, but someone rightly pointed out, yeah, we're in it together, but there are those of us that are out to sea in a mega yacht. And those of us who are hanging on to flotsam and jetsam as it goes by. So it's, I mean, how people experience the pandemic has such tremendous variety. I mean, being separated from older family members in nursing homes. And I, I mean, it's just, I, it, it's, it, again, it's just, yeah, remarkable what, what so many, too many had to endure um, the frontline workers, not oh. least among them. That's it. That this, even in some of the darkest moments, you hear some of these stories and you think mm -hmm. that's a beautiful moment that came from that. But mm -hmm. you're right, it's been so up and down for people. But mm -hmm. it's funny how having that situation where you couldn't work, it, in a funny way, it leads you to doing a tour that it certainly looks as if you Well, it did, it did for Pat, Patrick and me. And I, I mean, I was living in New York and, you know, very happy there. Patrick was happy as a clam living in Oregon. But we had bumped into each other uh, uh, a year, I guess, or so before the, before the pandemic. And I was returning to New York and, and we bumped into each other in LA at a function. And uh, I was returning to New York and going to see uh, a mutual friend in a play with whom Patrick had lost touch. And he said, oh, well, here's my email or phone number, whatever, put me back in touch with, with Richard. So, um, so I did. And, but so then we were in sort of a three-way chat for a bit and it was the happy Christmas. That was the extent of it. And then Patrick thought he might be coming through New York for some work. And so we were in touch briefly again, but then the pandemic hit and all that was off. And then we, we ended up texting again as we all were sort of, isn't this weird? What are you doing? And I retreated from New York to my home in Colorado and one thing led to another. Patrick and I started to Zoom uh, once a week, and then every night we Zoomed every night. I mean, there was nothing. There was nothing on our either of our calendars for like a year. So we we Zoomed, and and it was fun and and unusual, and we were discovering so many layers in common. Um, and at some point, a couple, two or three months in, it just turned a corner into, wait a minute, there might be something else going on here. So he eventually jumped in his car and drove to Colorado and we've been together since. But if we hadn't had that kind of concentration of time, it never would have happened. I mean, when on earth would we have or choose to have two to three hours to sit around and Zoom and really talk and also everything slowed down mm -hmm. you know there wasn't you weren't sort of looking to catch up I mean it was a it was a moment we were very lucky a, a real reset and real contemplation but the world went away you couldn't be a part of the world and the world that we were living in just didn't exist I mean entertainment didn't exist 
you couldn't see your friends, you couldn't go to restaurants, you couldn't go to plays, you couldn't perform or go to rehearsals or none of that. It was the dark ages. So there we sat, you know, in our respective caves, um, in the quiet and solitude of our own thoughts, sharing them. So that we time traveled, we, we got through a lot of stuff and a lot of knowing in a period of time that under no other circumstances can I imagine that happening. That is the ultimate meant to be for me. That is like, <laughs> that's like, again, like we say so many things can be a good meant to be moment and not so good, but you can understand that in the grand scheme of things, it, it turned out for the best. But that for me is the ultimate. So I don't think yes, that's oh. very, very fortunate. You know, at this stage, I don't know that I believe that everything is meant to be or that everything turns Just, out for the better. Yeah. I mean, you know, we've all seen horrendous things happen to the most spectacular, kind, generous, loving, charitable Christian people. Yes. So I think life, you know, is beautiful and, and can be cruel or life is cruel and can sometimes be beautiful. And yeah. this is a, a very beautiful thing for which we are very grateful. Oh, I think so. Yeah. And again, like you, you've, you've said it beautifully. Not everything always has its reason. Sometimes something happens and you're just like, oh, n don't know. That's just park that. That's not good. But like you say, there's certain things like this where look where we are now. And just mm -hmm. the fact that you're it sounds as if the tour has obviously it's hard work, but it sounds as if the mm -hmm. tour is also a nice blend of seeing different parts of the UK and Ireland. Oh, for sure. Able. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It's such a privilege. It's such a privilege. I mean, between being able to not just come through these towns, but it's weird. You get to a town and there's your picture up on a poster. <laughs> I mean, it's sort of fairy tale like, and um, yeah, to be on these stages where, you know, I mean, Sarah Bernhardt to Diana Rigg have performed <laughs> pretty much everything in between. You feel those ghosts as oh, you're there. And you know, that, that's a funny link. Um, when I went to university, it was um, Stirling University, but I did my teaching qualification and our rector was Dame Diana Rigg. And I am still so embarrassed. And I, I probably wasn't the only person, but when she shakes everyone's hand, I know my hand was so clammy. Uh, <laughs> I was terrified, but she was so nice. And oh, I remember thinking, what a lovely yeah. lady, because she's oh, just making all these clammy hands. Oh my, yeah. <laughs> for us, it's our biggest moment. And she was, sure. she was so lovely. But oh. I remember I wanted to say to her, I am so sorry. <laughs> uh. Yeah. But so that was a really nice moment that she was our university rector and she did a beautiful almost like a a positivity speech where she got us in the right frame of mind and she didn't have to do that some yeah. rectors will just come in give everyone their certificates and go but she that was really nice so that's something that stands out so when you say that again I think that's lovely that there are all these memories of all these different people and they inspire us all the time and for mm -hmm. very different reasons. But you must love that when you go to different towns and you see the venues and you see the history. Do we have more history in our theatres than most places? Oh, without a doubt. W without, without a doubt. Oh, for sure. And, and you feel that. I mean, some of our Broadway houses, I mean, through the 30s, in the States, there were a lot of theaters, a lot of lovely um, art deco theaters, but um, as for theaters built in the late 19th century, not nearly as many as, as here. Uh, yeah, England has a much longer, deeper, stronger tradition of theater I think nationally we, than we do. I think we take it for granted. I think we just have a look and say, I wonder what's on this month or I wonder what's coming up this year I think we take it for granted a bit but um what you say about Broadway though that's definitely on my bucket list I would love to see something in Broadway so yeah, you will. 
Oh, I hope so. But yeah. that's, I think that's a lovely place to finish because you've got me really excited for coming to see the play. I really can't wait to see what else you do. Are there things in the pipeline? Because I saw your quarantine video from Canada. That was very funny. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> We're in quarantine. Um, you know, who knows? I mean, there's some talk of maybe a movie in August, but but we don't know. We just have to just sort of take it in, as it comes. Just enjoy it as you find it. Then that's I think right. that's exactly. the best way to be. And enjoy the singing. I hope I get to come and see Cabaret too. I'm going to keep an eye out if you get to do something again in London. I'm going to definitely. I see. will. I think we'll be back next spring and do something. So yeah, oh, great. that's fantastic. Well, thank you so much for talking to me, and I look forward to seeing you in Glasgow. Thank you very much. Take good care now. Oh, thank you. I so enjoyed chatting with Linda and thanks again, Linda, for your time. I could have spent hours asking so many questions about her career. If you would like to catch up with what Linda's up to, you can follow her on Instagram. It's at Linda Pearl. And there's also the website lindapearl.com. I cannot wait to see this show. I've only got to wait about a month more and you can be sure that I will be letting you know on my social media how much I enjoyed it because I just know with a cast like this and it being a Bill Kenwright production, it's going to be fabulous. So thanks for listening and I'll see you again soon. Mm-hmm.